They're being punched severely, but can they hang on? I got him an absolute ripper to square up. It's folklore. Couldn't write a script about it. Now it's on. It's about to explode. Ferret is down. Ferret is down behind play. He looks as if he's been knocked out. It was emotional. It was the best feeling I've ever had in my life. Ramos in best position. Great mark over the top. If they get after us, do not be distracted. I could not believe how brutal the game was. We can win this. We can win it. My memories are pretty good of what life was like in 1989, but in all honesty, the way I, I lived my life in 89, it was... You could turn it into a movie. There's a rumour going around that uh, a certain player in the Hawthorne Football Club waxes his bum. Who is this bum? Rob, he'd be sneaking around with a camera wherever he we went and trying to capture the moment. You don't even have to sort of click his fingers and these guys would come out of the woodwork to do something in front of a camera. I remember the first time we, we, we actually did it was in Japan. And we trusted Rob, of course, you know, one of us. And, you know, we'd be in the spa talking stuff and I'd be interviewing boys and, and I was practising, hopefully one day I was going to be the boundary rider. Lolly, what about you, son? Did you have a good day? Sensational. Nudity means nothing in a footy club. If you got it, you got it. <laughs> if you haven't, well, you hide. No comment. I'm not a bloody nude shot. I'm sick of it. It's not funny. It's a bloody disgrace. Could you imagine doing it today? Naked in the MCG members' grandstand. It was just crazy stuff. This is Jason Dunstall on the Sun classified ad in all around Melbourne. He's now in London. He's huge. Filming behind the scenes, and we thought someday we might be able to see that if we go to Rob's house. We never knew it was going to be put into mass print. I think it was called Good for Football. All he'd say is it's good for football. It's good for football. Well, here we are, Niagara Falls. And quite frankly, I'm quite disappointed. I can't see what all the big deal's about. Welcome to Bertie's Shoe Shop. I've been uh, a part of this establishment now for about 30 years. We played hard, we trained hard, and we partied hard. We would have some terrific times with a bloke like Rob that kept us all together and made it such an enjoyable time. How are you feeling your last game, Andy? Uh, I think it's a relief more than anything, Robert. Are you um, quite emotional after the game? Oh, well, I, you know, it's, it's the last game and I know I don't have to train anymore, so I, was, I think I was happy with joy more than anything. Hawthorne players past and present were in mourning today after hearing the news that Dixon had been killed in a car crash in South Africa. We lost Rob Dixon in 2009. The heartbreak was... It's a huge loss to his family, huge loss to Hawthorne Football Club. He had a very special gift. You can see that in his filmmaking, you can see that in his life. We were so lucky to have a bloke like Rob. He was part of the fabric of the place. He was a beauty. How are you? We're from, we're from Australia. 60 minutes, we've got the, a live interview. Yeah. Uh, we're just wondering if you could tell us the finer aspects of England. The finer aspects of England? <laughs> <laughs> have you heard of John Kennedy? Have I heard of John Kennedy? He's a Hawthorne footballer. No, he's good for football and you're good for football. Thanks very much. Sure he is a good footballer. Absolutely fantastic for him to give that gift back to us in putting that film together. Good for football, which was good for football. Oh, Dermot, please don't go without saying a word. Dermot, uh, to all your fans here in Japan, we would like to say, what would you like to say? A big thank you, baby, Tim, for a rifle tip and uh, tell the fuck. Wow, wow, did you get that, people? <laughs> <laughs> did he make any money out of that? Oh, man. <laughs> this season, the Hawks finished on top of the ladder with just three losses in 22 games. Glen Ferry people will tell you that they have never seen a bunch of footballers so dedicated, so desperate and so intent on reaching the Hawthorne Holy Grail, two premierships in a row. You are, without doubt, the best side in the competition during the course of the year. But football in every level is littered with the best sides in the competition to get done on grand final day. So we got Alan Jones back in 89 because he was um, had a brain hemorrhage in 88 and Alan Joyce obviously took that side over. The illness in 88, I said to Joyce, you win it this year and I'll come back next year and win it. And 
Hawthorne had never won back-to-back -back premierships. The old system was if you finished on top, you got a week's break, you went straight to the second semi. The winner of the second semi went straight to the grand final. So we had the week's break, finished on top, won the second semi and went straight to the grand final. It's a bit of aggression out there too, wasn't it? Oh yeah, that's, that's part of the finals and it was a pretty hard-hitting pump. Hawthorne's Peter Schwab copped a three-week suspension as a result of a striking charge. After the hearing, the 29-year-old fought back the tears. I can't say much. I've got to accept it. That's the way it goes. And footy's a character building game, mate, so thanks. Training began at about five when the huge crowd gave the Hawks a tremendous ovation as they came down the race onto the oval. Greg Madigan, a 19-year-old defender Ruckman, may be the surprise selection in place of Peter Schwab, meaning Robert Dixon may miss a place in the side. It probably threw the team balance into whether you bring Rob Dixon in, whether you bring Greg Madigan in, and Greg Madigan got his chance and grabbed it with two hands. And I can remember seeing Rob afterwards and, you lucky bastard, you lucky bastard, that's all I can remember him saying. The most difficult part is uh, on the Thursday night before a grand final, you're going to go and tell five or six blokes, uh, uh, that they're not in the side. In every grand final, there's someone who, who has a, a story to tell. And in this one, it was Rob. It was Rob. Yeah, we were sad about it, you know, because he was such a popular guy. But the reality is someone had to miss out. There's nothing like the whiff of a premiership flag to get the footy fans up and roaring. And when it's the boys from Sleepy Hollow who have the chance to pull off the big one, those Geelong fans go mad. 89 was a great period of our footy life, so there's no doubt about that. John Devine was their former coach. We'd finished out of the top five for three years in a row under John, and then Malcolm Blight came along. He was the saviour, the superstar. I was in my late 30s when I went there. I would think probably in my prime as a coach, you know, you'd actually got your picture of your game, and the players embraced it. I found his game plan terrific. It was all out attack. Kick goals quickly and kick plenty of them. Yeah, guilty as charged. Whoever kicks the most goals usually wins. So perhaps some other people think if you stop more, you win more. But I, I still haven't, I, I can't get it. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we find ourselves in the finals. Geelong, they were humiliated first up by Essendon, but then bounced back to beat Melbourne and then turned the tables on Essendon in a remarkable reversal of form. Remember, there was 89,000 against Essendon. So there was just this momentum, just this rise of momentum of this new force in footy. Suddenly next week's grand final may not be as predictable as earlier thought. We fit it together well today and uh, hopefully we can put it together next week. All on our side to be respected so we're not going to get carried away with today. You know, we're in a grand final, we had to celebrate. So you go up to the social club back then in the good old days and we had a few there and then a couple of the uh, nightclubs in town. Stars, oh my God. I still remember myself and uh, another player that I probably I can't name, but he was a very good centre forward. Grabbing a, a, a garbage truck on the way home. Barry, I mean, the other player and myself were hanging off the back of it. And the worst thing there was that the Garbo, he actually knew where I lived and dropped me straight at home. I just couldn't see that happening nowadays, you know. Cashing in on our love of footy. Against the Cadbury Super Team today. The Cats may be the underdogs for tomorrow's game, but there's no doubt they've got popular support for their finals appearance, at least enough in the Burke Street procession to bring a smile to a Brownlow medal winner's face. We had a Friday parade. We met at the footy club, had a training session, had a meeting after. I spoke to Yada first day and I said, look, um, Couchy's won the medal. Are you interested in making an insurance policy for him? There was word on the street that Dermot had his eye on trying to stitch Couchy up in the middle. Mark, uh, I'll give you three minutes um, to sit him on his backside. And he said, yeah, I'll think about that. And then the Friday night we confirmed it. We played them earlier in the year. Mr Brereton damaged one of my testicles. In the pre-game build-up, right, oh, oh, that was a free kick. And I made out, put my hand up as if I was going for the ball, which I didn't really do. Put my knee right through the middle of him. Didn't care where it got him. Obviously, Yatesy didn't like that, but he certainly didn't like Dermot uh, following him to the boundary line on the stretcher and saying things about uh, Yatesy's missus that uh, was a good sort, actually, and we all liked her. But uh, I think Dermot had a fair bit to say about that, too. Yeah, I just walked alongside and bad mouthed him and whatever. Yeah, we did stuff like that in those days. 
I remember that clearly. A lot of people didn't. The, in the back of my mind after that incident, um, I was livid. And whether it was in the, in the, in the grand final or the next time we played Hawthorne, I was hell-bent on squaring up. Hawthorne, a mean fighting machine, looking to make it back-to-back -back premiership wins. And Geelong, the glamour side of the season. The flashy cats have taken all before them and are now set to challenge for their first flag since 1963. This is the 1989 VFL Grand Final. There was an air of tension in the room. Just that anticipation, your guts just goes and turns. There's no doubt there's the nerves come and visits to the toilet are often. I remember going to the toilet um, at one stage with about 10 minutes before we run out and he said, um, you right, Yatesy? And I said, yeah, I'm right, right. I wouldn't mind a smoke, though. <laughs> and he had a pile, a pile around his feet. Uh, he was chain smoking, I think. <laughs> I'm not sure about the puff. Here comes John Farnham. Whispering Jack, John Farnham, come into the rooms and roared from the top of his voice, Can the Catters! I'm with you! And I had a real giggle because I thought, oh, I like whispering Jack. I'm going to go over and shake his hand. And Mick Schultz was standing next to me, and uh, Mick wasn't that impressed. Put the hand, I said, I love your work, Jack. <laughs> Strutted back over next to Schultz, he goes, you're an idiot. <laughs> Thank you very much. The best time of a grand final is actually going into the room before the bounce of the ball. Because that's where it's all at. You're in that room together with the guy you're going out to fight with and, and Jeansy about to give you those last words. Jeansy said to me before the game, I'm going to say a few things today. I hope you take them the right way, son. I said to Brian Coleman through the week, I'm going to get stuck into Demi before the game. It gets reported, that's just bad luck. I gave him a nice old serve in front of the players before the game. I've got a fairly staunch Irish heritage, full of turmoil in history gone by. Yabby, in the pre-match, basically made the analogy, might have happened to someone in your family 60, 70 years ago, but today you're in the firing line. Somebody's got a loaded gun and they've got it pointed at your head. That's how you respond. And at the time I was dirty on him that he brought up a private conversation between him and me. And it was family business. It was emotional. You got to understand the psyche of Dermot, and you got to understand Alan Jeans's approach to coaching, to understand why he did it, because he knew that if he did it to Dermot, he would get a reaction. We all want to wear the jumper, but are we prepared to accept the responsibility that goes with it? Just depends how mentally tough you are. He knew how to to get the best out of you, because we're all different people, right? Now, normally coaches will go, come on, you blokes, come on. You've got to get in and do it, all that sort of stuff. But Jeansy would say to, to Bucky, you know, Bucky, we can't win without you. We cannot win without you, Buck. Where Dermot, myself and a few others, you know, go, pull your bloody finger out, make sure you get in there and stop playing lair rising around, right? That's the way he got to us. The body manifests what the mind harbours. I know when you're playing at your best, you are capable. You've earned this opportunity. Don't waste it, regardless of what goes on out on the ground. We can win this. We can win it. I remember Dermot when the door was about to open to run out on the ground and he was right up against the door and now it's on. You know, it's about to explode. Geelong, they come down the race now. Just remember saying to them, take it all in, you know, look around and really absorb it all, don't hide from it. But when we come in, ready, after we won the toss, just look up to the box and... Raise your arm towards me with a fist clenched and I'll know you switched on. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. No, we didn't do it. Geelong boys all linked hands in the centre, then turned around and gave the fist up back to the member stand. Did we? No, yeah. <laughs> Where'd that come from? I've got no idea. Drace with Hydrolite. The live finals begin Sunday, 6.30 on 9.
Dermot, well known for his aggression. I think you'll find in the first 10 minutes of this game, he'll try and unsettle a few of the Geelong players. I knew they were thinking I might run in and try and pick off somebody. I, Geelong jumper, it didn't bother me. So I'm thinking, geez, I can't wait for the centre bounce. I can't wait for this. This is on, you know. Yates is going to be ready. Dermot's not going to be ready for it. I remember lining up, envisaging what was going to happen. I reckon I could get to him within three seconds at least and have a crack. Mick Schultz had lined up on, on Dermot. I was on the half forward flank. I looked across and Mick was actually standing on my side. And I just gave him a head nod and he jumped around the other side. And then the siren went. About three metres away, he saw me. I see him. I'm frightened. And the triangle met ferociously. Ferrance is down. Ferrance is down behind play. He looks as if he's been knocked out. Jumped up. I mean, he made contact with me again, but my by then, I'm in shock from the hit. His eyes were rolling back a bit, and I said, uh, how does that feel? Game on. You know, you're not going to run through huddles. You're not going to run through us. We're going to match everything today that you throw at us. He's really nailed me. You've lost all pride about showing him you're not hurt. And I just thought of that pain I was in um, back at Princess Park. Gary Ablett will go very close from here, from about 52 metres. Long, probing kick, it's home. Gazza kicks a goal, and we're all jumping around on top of him. I look around, there's Dermot on the ground. I thought, oh, shit, I missed it. What the hell is going on? That's not the way it's supposed to start. I'm thinking I've got to go off. You're done. Your first step of broken ribs is the first vibration that goes through your body is <laughs> every breath. <laughs> oh. So. And my system went into a bit of shock and I, I vomited. And I took the first step. And I heard the thoughts, the philosophies, the principles of life from Alan Jeans. In every game, there is going to be a crossroad. And when you get to that crossroad, you either step up or you step down. It is an entitled all up to you. You make the decision, not me. And I ended up just an endless scream. Ah, I just did it until I ran out of voice. To get up, just not go off. He could have gone off. Most of us would have gone straight off. He was hurt big time. Um, I know that more than anyone uh, and respect him for that. They're giving it their best shot and he's still standing, so let's really make this count. It was a balancing of the ledger. It was the moment that they recognised I'd cop my own whack and not whinge about it as well. What a psychological boost that is for the Cats. So Geelong all fired up. Currents kick wide to half forward. Marking contest up there. It's a clean mark for Dunstall. Dunstall, early minutes. The most inspirational act of seeing Boss playing was folklore. He couldn't write a script about it. I actually went back thinking this will see me off, but I've got to go. He's put it through. It's a perfect reply for me, and I knew then the game was on. It's on centre wing. This is gonna be the order of the day. I thought it might have started earlier than now. Runs on one side and views on the other. And I know Gary Hawkins got my head and he's smacking my head in. See the two little midgets trying to, it's like kids trying to fight their dad. The sand on the MCG was everywhere, it was going in our eyes and <laughs> he's blinded. He don't know I'm blinded because he's whinging about it. Who's throwing sand in my eyes? Who's throwing sand? Condon gathers the hand pass. Towards 
shot. Looks at it across his body, another goal to Hawthorne. It's the first to recover, and Ferrell's in the action. Down goes Darcy. Well, at least he's going to make them pay for it. He's injured. He's got to go off. I suppose he's going to take one or two scalps with him. Hawkins away, gets the hand pass away quickly to Yates, who puts it down towards full forward. Bramble's in best position. Great mark over the top. It was always going to be his. Brownless. 35 metres. Stands at goal with a time. Great kick, I think, Hawthorne's way. Yates, Gary, Hawking. Looking at a minute ago from 55 metres out. Good looking kick. That's a goal. Hawthorne certainly on a rampage, and they want back-to-back -back premierships. Watch oh, half forward with the kick. Intended for Ablett. Up he comes. He crashes in the middle of the go. That hurt. Ablett's behind me, telling me what he's going to do. I'm coming to get you, big fella. You know, and I can feel him. I can hear him. I did hear my ribs break. And adrenaline takes you to places that people don't know they can get to. My body was changing. My body was inflating. But my voice is really high. Hey, kick it to me. You all right, Debra? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. It's OK. I just thought it was open warfare. If you put your head over the ball, you caught what was coming. If they get after us, do not be distracted by anything other than going at the ball. I mean, I was half impressed with Hawthorne. After all that had happened at the start, they just hardly missed a kick. In the 10 metre square front. Lee Mark on the goal square. Directly in front. No problems. There's the siren. So the first quarter finishes. The Cats, they really have an enormous job in front of them. Malcolm Blight has got to get his boys to settle down. Just shout for some reason or other. You feel as though you have to shout because you're down. If we can just get back on the scoreboard, let's see him back a goal or two this quarter and then we'll review it at half time. Quarter time, after the huddle broke up, he walked past. He looked at me and I said, hey, Yates, I'm still here. Yeah, I'm still here. And I said, well, come over here. Melbourne's three heroes in a sudden death finals blockbuster. Saturday at 7, the storm and the nights.